Hey everybody, welcome back to the crux of the matter. We have a really special episode for you today. Uh, last time around we had our first guests and that was in person. This one is special because obviously it's virtual. The school year's over and me and Landon are back home. Um, but our guest today is uh, Ethan Raby and Ethan is a cybersecurity analyst at a local institution and he's also one of my good buddies. So say hello to everybody, Ethan. Yeah, hey, uh, it's great to be here. Thank you guys for having me on. For sure. We're glad so, you're here. Uh, yeah, you're a little bit of an expert. So why don't you tell us what it is, essentially what you do, without obviously giving away too many details. Well, expert's a stretch. I've worked uh, as an analyst for about a year now. So not a long time, but I've worked in IT for a while. But uh, I specialize in cybersecurity operations. So a lot of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is protecting uh, valuable data for my company. So making sure that hackers don't get into our systems and making sure that our members' information is secure. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, making sure people's stuff doesn't get stolen, Absolutely. at least all of the internet, which is what we're talking about today. Um, so just to get started, uh, this is sort of one of those things where not a lot of people are experts about it. So what what basically are cyber attacks? What do, what do they do in essence? So cyber attacks are a very broad term for any kind of malicious intent towards a computer or computer network. So this could be anything from like phishing attacks, for example, to making malware like Stuxnet that takes down an entire nuclear facility. So there's a very broad spectrum of things that are considered cyber attacks. Hmm. And All for right. our audience who might not know, did you want to give a brief uh, explanation of what Stuxnet is, or do you want to cover that later? So, yeah, I think we'll go over more of that later, but Stuxnet is a malware, specifically a worm that was engineered by the US government um, in, along with Israel uh, as an attempt to take down Iran's nuclear program. Uh, mm -hmm. It was sort of either that or airstrike. Um, the Bush administration decided that was the better option. I don't know if I agree with that, but mm -hmm. we'll probably get into that more later and sort of the politics behind that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, and this is this is one of those important subjects because I think you know not a lot of people know about it, but it's one of the ways that warfare happens nowadays, and uh, it's it's a little bit different than mm -hmm. you know, like you know when my dad was in the force and you know you, we send over, um, you know ten thousand, hundred thousand, hundreds of thousands of guys, and we go over and take over Iraq in a hundred days. It's a little bit different form of warfare, and you know, that sort of uh, you know leads me to ask like should i guess we should get into it later i don't want to immediately get into whether you know cyber attacks are a form of warfare because that's a little bit of a of a charged topic from my understanding yeah but, uh, yeah landon you want to take this yeah i think right now we should really frame our questions with how we want to take this direction of conversation so we can either go over the broad topics of cybersecurity, the field that's emerging from it and then we can go more towards like our opinions on Stuxnet, more towards uh, what um, like is cyber security threats, war, et cetera, et cetera. So I mm. think right now I can ask the question, uh, do you see cybersecurity becoming a emerging field of concern, especially for the US? Uh, and also how should we as civilians or lay people who don't have fields of expertise in that, uh, how should we try to respond? How should we inform ourselves? Uh, should legislation be passed? Um, anything else? Yeah. 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 So I think that this was an emerging field like 10 years ago, like security for networking is in my opinion, five years where behind where it needs to be. And it always has been and probably always will. Because if you think about how much stuff is on the internet that grows exponentially. We don't have the resources with cybersecurity to be able to track all of that stuff with how fast it's growing. So we really don't have a good way to secure everything. It's basically secure everything the best you can and hope <laughs> nothing gets through. So 
developing better techniques and more accurate like engines to find this stuff so that people don't have to spend countless hours traversing data themselves to find threats uh, is a big part of what cybersecurity is now. Um, but yeah, the reason people need to like keep this stuff in mind is because there's not always going to be some IT admin to help keep you safe on the internet, you know? Like if you're just at home browsing the internet on your own, you need to know what's safe, what isn't, that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. With how much stuff there is on the internet, like there's probably not many people these days that haven't been infected with some virus at some point and not known it, so. Yeah. I was looking at the list of the largest uh, cyber attacks in history, and I think the second largest was the Yahoo uh, massive data leak. I think it affected, I can't remember the number, but I think it was 1.8 billion people. And yeah, uh, yeah my, mom, my mom and dad had some of their uh, information leaked. So, you know, it's mm -hmm. just like, it's just one of those things uh, where pretty much everyone has their information somewhere on the dark net available for sale. And yeah, so there's this website called haveibeenpwned.com. That's pwn spelled P-W-N-E-D. <laughs> and basically what it does is it just keeps track of every data leak that's ever happened, and it mm. stores all that. And you can put in, like, your email or your phone number and see if you've been pwned, so to say. And mm. that's basically just has your password or other information linked to that account been leaked at some point. And it's surprising. The number is something like 12 billion different accounts have been pwned. So, oh, wow. my gosh. <laughs> That's so a insane. lot of data floating around out there. Yeah. And, and the other it, thing it's is... A good, it's a good reminder to regularly change your password because these things yeah. happen all the time. Yeah. That is, uh, that's something i got to get better at. I did just change a couple this last year, but I have, like, so many random things just floating around and I haven't changed them enough so it's just sort of one of those things where it's part of it plays into part of I'm a boomer and I'm not very good with technology so I don't ever do smart things like you know uh <laughs> change my passwords and stuff like that yeah but, well 99 percent of people don't so yeah so be so, the odd one percent that's the moral of this story <laughs> yes mm -hmm. definitely so I guess uh, beyond some really simple tips like, you know, change your password uh, because I feel like most people aren't going to fall for, hello, I am a prince from India and I need money so I could get out of the United States and reclaim my kingdom. You know, like most people aren't going to fall for that kind of email that people get, the Nigerian. Well, here's the, here's the thing. That, it's not as obvious anymore. Like it happens all the time. The biggest issue we face in the financial industry when it comes to cyber stuff is phishing or smishing or hmm. phishing, which are all types of the same thing. It's basically mm -hmm. somebody calls you over the phone or sends you a text or an email mm -hmm. saying like, Hey, your account's been frozen or whatever. And people fall for this daily, mm -hmm. like several times a day, you know, somebody gets their account broken into and yeah, you know, it's, it's a problem. Like it's the biggest issue we face right now for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, like compared to malware, like malware is dangerous, but it's, we're pretty secure against that. Like it's easy to see what's malware and what isn't for the most part. Mm -hmm. We can regulate that stuff. We can't regulate what other people are doing and what information they're giving out. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. And that reminds me of like a Mark Rober, uh, short YouTube documentary that he made. I don't know if either of you watched it but how specifically mm. the elderly population are often targeted. Someone goes in, she's trying to help uh, the IT person. He's like, oh, I accidentally added too many zeros to your bank account. I need the money back or I'll lose my job and my family's counting on me. And they yes. play on your sympathy, right? And so I think, yeah, all of us civilians who are completely ignorant of these topics really should pay attention um, and really know, like, if something says, oh, your account's been frozen, don't respond to the email. I think the first thing you do when you're emotional, take a breath, wait, either call your bank, call whatever institution mm -hmm. is involved. Uh, and it can be a hassle, but it's smarter than instantly responding, trying to feed into it, right? Yeah, you leave yes, that hacker and, and on here's red. The thing, like, your financial institution is never going to ask you anything about like your passwords or anything. They're not going to ask you for your password to your account or whatever. 
Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's a sure sign that somebody's trying to get into your stuff. Mm -hmm. So don't fall for that. Obviously, um, social engineering, unfortunately has gotten a lot better. Like it's, like I said, it's not as obvious anymore. And it's, it's actually a lot more targeted now. Like people know that there's bigger fish in the sea than just preying on elderly people. So yeah, this is a term called whaling, which a lot of cybersecurity professionals think this is a ridiculous term. Um, mm. huh. But yeah, it's basically targeted phishing attacks on like VIPs and stuff. So mm. oh, like, wow. if you're a VIP, you're like CEO of Google or whatever, like you're a hot target for people. Mm. So yeah. And I mean, even people in those positions, like, if you fall for a good social engineering trick, it, you know, like it could be something as simple as like following somebody through a locked door or whatever into a place they're not supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say yeah. like there's a data center and you access that data center with like an access card or something. Yeah. And then, then somebody else comes in, they say they're from IT or whatever, and they just need to be let in. Like that happens all the right. time. Like mm -hmm. maybe not within data centers, but you know, yeah. In other areas, that, that's definitely an issue. It's like simple social engineering tricks to get people a long ways. Hmm. Yeah, that's like me at Guad trying to get Landon to let me in because my car didn't There's work stranger danger. The semester. Yeah, <laughs> stranger danger. I don't know you. Welcome back. We are here for part two of the interview with Ethan. We are going to cover the next topic about specific cyber attacks and their role in society. So uh, I don't know if many of you guys remember, but in 2021 during the summer or late spring, there were two major cyber attacks on government or private companies. One was the Colonial Pipeline on natural gas, and the second mm -hmm. one was on a meat uh, packaging plant, if I understand correctly. I don't mm -hmm. know if you want to fill in, Ethan or Riley. Yeah, so um, it's sort of the whole meat, the the meat plant one is like kind of a weird thing that happened uh, over and over again during 2021, not just cyber attacks, but like uh, food processing plants, like burning down and stuff like all at the same time, like as a supply chain issue was going on, which was just insanely weird. Um, but yeah, it's as far as the specific attack goes, I remember that like being in the news a lot. So yeah, I'm not actually super familiar with, uh, like, the meat plant hack. Um, I am pretty familiar with what happened in the uh, Colonial Pipeline attack. So that was in May or June, as I recall. But yeah, I think they got yeah. hit with with ransomware. So what ransomware is is it's a type of virus. So that means it installs itself through some other application that you might have downloaded. Uh, viruses are transmitted through files, so that's how it gets from the internet down to somebody's computer or wherever it's going. Um, but the thing that differentiates it from other viruses is that it's specifically, it's, well, ransomware. It charges you a ransom to access your computer, so... Mm. Um, it'll encrypt files typically, and the only way you can unencrypt them is by paying the attackers but what like the government will tell you is that you are not supposed to do that um go to the fbi and they'll typically help you with that yeah um, sure but paying the ransomware never solves the problem so yeah i think the fbi is a little bit busy coordinating uh how to who to censor <laughs> meme accounts on twitter so yeah, too busy ignoring child pornography and cyber warfare, yeah. and things that they should actually be paying attention to. So yeah. But yeah, again, just bringing this more to the audience's uh, kind of perspective is why does it matter? And so what I'd argue is, well, Colonial Pipeline had produced about 37% of the US electricity for 2021, because natural gas is a lot larger of an energy source than a lot of people realize. And so realizing how simply a group can target and completely cripple U.S. infrastructure uh, really begs the question, should we start creating a more 
informed public and pushing legislators to create new legislation to boost cybersecurity funding, to improve our uh, cyber kind of firewalls per speak. I guess that's a vague term. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, kind of what to improve on. Yeah, I think uh, one thing that a a lot of people were very focused on when this whole issue of cyber warfare started to become a thing was a lot of people were worried about, and it's in fiction, like too, like there's a lot of fiction spy novels that sort of mirror the real world, um, but EMP bombs and people, people are very worried about that. Like what if another country such as Russia or China detonated an EMP bomb over somewhere like New York or Chicago? And doubtless that would be insanely, insanely, uh, you know, damaging, but it also would be like open warfare. And then it's like, okay, what's going to happen? Are we just going to send an EMP bomb right back at Russia or China? Are we going to nuke them? Are, are we going to declare war on them? So I think this sort of plays into, um, you know, where cyber warfare comes from. Because one of the uh, main proponents of cyber warfare, some of the main actors who engage in it are actually government agencies. And so is it a more f effective uh, way to do, you know, combat now? I don't know. Yeah, and it... it... Really, if you look at it, one of the most targeted industries when it comes to cyber attacks is like energy infrastructure, which is like a really big problem. Like with conventional warfare, you're supposed to target the other military. You're not supposed to go after civilians. That's international humanitarian law. That's the rules of warfare. You're not supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to cyber stuff, there's not any rules for that. Nobody knows how to do it because it's so new like it's only been around a couple of decades if that like i mean 2010 was when it really first started being used in stuxnet so mm -hmm. yeah, it's safe it, to say it, they weren't thinking about it at the it, geneva it convention. makes the question should we actually be using this as a weapon or not you know when mm -hmm. we're targeting people's energy infrastructure, how many lives is that going to damage? You know, how many people rely on electricity for their everyday lives, you know, like, you know, this actually, it reminds me, it's a little bit of a close parallel to, uh, during the American civil war, what the North did, uh, the South was actually doing quite well. And part of it could be argued it was Lincoln's choice of generals up until Ulysses S. Grant. Um, but it also could be argued that they were not using the right kind of warfare. And what they ended up doing was burning down plantations and destroying railway systems all across the South. And so the South's infrastructure was completely destroyed. And so that lot led to a lot of bitterness and resentfulness and the whole story of reconstruction that we all know. Um, but it was one of those things where that's one of the first couple of wars where you have metal ships and, you know, you're starting to have new artillery instead of, you know, wood and and uh and just you know we're just after the civil war where it's muskets and so there's so, sort of new sort of new proto guns and this is just one of those things where it's a new technology horizon uh in warfare and like have we crossed it yet i don't know yeah i mean when it comes to quote-unquote cyber warfare it's about as different from every other warfare as like sea versus air like mm -hmm. you know when we went from ships to airplanes like that's a big leap like it's it's a whole different battle you have to learn how to fight mm -hmm. and everybody's trying to do everything at the same time so yeah and this is this kind of like uh it leads me to ask another question you were talking about uh in the first segment the amount of data that there is just floating around the internet mm -hmm. so it, I, as far as the actual, uh, I would say, like skill level, is it more with ransomware attackers? Are they pushing the new, are they the ones more pushing new innovation? Or is it the people who are having to do security and defense and that kind of thing? Or is it just, you know, a 50-50 toss-up? Well, that I would say that's hard to say, and I don't really know. Somebody could probably tell you the answer. I would say people who are in cybersecurity are probably pushing the most for it. So mm -hmm. in cybersecurity, there's two main teams so to say there's blue team and there's red team so blue team is like defensive so they do all of like the firewall rule management they're the ones that make all the policies to keep information safe and how to prevent attacks and how to deal with attacks when they do eventually happen red team is offensive security 
So companies will hire teams dedicated to intentionally trying to hack into their own stuff just so they can find out how secure it is. Mm. And so with that comes threat hunting and stuff like that, where you're looking for new vulnerabilities and systems, even though you're not planning on exploiting those vulnerabilities yourself. Mm. So there's a lot of research in cybersecurity these days when it comes to that stuff. Uh, but it's definitely research is being pushed by the bad guys too. So mm -hmm. ransomware is um, typically being pushed by groups motivated by money. Mm -hmm. So that's a good motivator for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, but, that's fair to say. Yeah. And so the more advanced your ransomware is, the bigger companies you can target, the more money you can make. Mm. It's, it's a money game for those people. And the other group that's really a problem is the political side because they're sponsored by, you know, their states to carry out whatever cyber operations they need to. Mm -hmm. um, and China's a big example of that, right? Yeah. I think you said something in the notes like 70% of mm -hmm. all uh, yeah. corporate intellectual property theft is from China. Yeah. And that's definitely believable. If you look at examples from the past, like Project Aurora, uh, mm. happened around the same time as Stuxnet, actually. So around 2009, 2010, I want to say. Mm -hmm. um, a group sponsored by the People's Liberation Army of China, right, broke yeah. into a whole bunch of American tech companies and... I think fortunately, like Google didn't lose a lot of data from that, but um, that was a really scary event. Google actually has a really good YouTube series on it. Mm. Um, it's really easy for everybody to follow, so I I would advise everybody to watch it because it's really interesting. So yeah, Operation Aurora. So the so the companies that were affected were Google, Adobe, Akamai, Juniper Networks, Rackspace, Yahoo, Symantec, Northrop. Huge one, Morgan Stanley and Dow Chemical Company. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, this is actually a very, very interesting read. So, and I guess, yeah. Ethan, would you say that there's a general trend of increasing cyber attacks, um, or at least their publicity? Um, that's hard to say, and it depends on the cyber attack. Like, phishing for sure social engineering, that kind of stuff is becoming more common for sure because it's easy and everybody can do it, mm -hmm. right? As well as what's called script kitties. Um, it's kind of a derogatory term for <laughs> hackers that don't really have a lot of their own skills, so they use malware that already exists on the internet. Mm -hmm. So, but because of the amount of information that exists on the internet, like it doesn't take a genius to figure out how to make malware anymore. So it's definitely becoming more common, but there are certain kinds of malware that are becoming less common. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because, yeah, yeah, I think some people aren't aware, but there's so much open source code on the Internet. And, I mean, mm -hmm. all of us who've taken any programming classes, I mean, we look up, oh, how do I do this in Python or how do I do this in R? And, I mean, it's out there. So, yeah, mm -hmm. like the script kiddies people. It's <laughs> it definitely <laughs> doesn't take a genius to know how to just do something really malicious. Yeah. Yeah, it does take basic tech competence, so at least I'm not going to hack into your bank account anytime <laughs> soon. Well, yeah, at least we'll we hope see. So. Just don't don't leave your password lying around. <laughs> I won't. I hope. I hope so. Anyway. All right. So I mean, I guess we've sort of covered uh, phishing, malware, ransomware, general stuff like this. Um, we've we've sort of covered why normal people should care, and it's because. Uh, just another thing that we really haven't talked about in detail is just if you think about the amount of information that someone had to take care of, let's say in the fifties, like just how you have to keep receipts and know how many you know taxes you're going to pay at the end of the year. I mean, their tax code wasn't over 600,000 pages long, but it was still complicated enough where you had to keep your receipts. Um, and you know, uh, information about your kids and your social security number is like a physical card that's locked away somewhere. Um, and your car purchases and any sort of thing. But now there's 
the internet, it's one of those things where it's a blessing and a curse. I mean, you have more knowledge than any king who ever lived um, for thousands and thousands of years. The Library of Alexandria had nothing compared to a, you know, five second Google search on any subject. And uh, it's just one of those sort of things where uh, there's a huge increase in knowledge, but obviously people's, uh, you know, forever immoral hearts and evil minds are, are going to figure out how to make something bad out of it. And the same thing with the printing press uh, when it came around. I mean, it obviously led to a lot of good, maybe not in Luke and Ryan's opinion, but the uh, Protestant Reformation and how quickly uh, the reforms were able to spread throughout Europe and that sort of thing. But obviously there were some very damaging uh, ideas that were mass produced, like communism. Does that mean we should, you know, does that mean we should renege on the on the technological advances we made? I don't think so. I'm not Ted Gazinsky, but you know, it's 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 one of those things where we have to adapt to the new medium. So, yeah. And I think if we are adapting too quickly, like think of Neuralink. Of course, they say they'd only want to implant chips in people paralyzed or for healthcare reasons. Nope. But again, that's another thing that can be hacked. And when you have your life on the line, I mean, I think there was one cyber attack which occurred somewhat recently that finally took its first actual victims. I put that in quotes because, of course, they all include victims. But very mm -hmm. clearly, it was at a hospital, shut down its electricity, and killed patients. And I think, Ethan, you brought up a very good point earlier on how does it end up correlating to warfare and uh, where does it go beyond the Geneva Convention's law? Because, again, this is taking a direct aim at civilians, not only militaries. And all the laws of armed conflict get thrown out the window when things like hospitals are involved. And does this mean war crimes? Uh, can there even be a country at fault if they're harboring an independent group? Again, these are all mm. questions, yeah, that will be introduced in the future. Yeah. One of the things about the age of monarchs is that um, you don't really have these beyond uh, occasional raving bands that would go out and burn down a village occasionally. Uh, it's just like the power centers in the modern world are everywhere. They're not just governments. And so it's just one of these things, the difference between de facto and de jure power. So de jure power is power that's written in the letter of the law. It's what uh, is like formally what power means. And then there's de facto power, which is what is actually... In control. So, just to give you an example, um, you know, I, I'm a fairly right leaning person. So, generally speaking, I would vote for Republicans, even though they're an awful party that needs to be gotten rid of. Uh, if you were to give me the option between Republicans get the Supreme Court, they get all of Congress and the presidency, but Democrats get every uh, social institution, they get all the social media companies, they get all the journalists. They get every cultural institution. They get all of Hollywood, including all the independent producers and everything. I would never make that trade because hmm. the actual de, de facto power is a lot more with cultural institutions than the government. I mean, because the president doesn't have the same amount of power he used to have. Um, the president can't rule with an iron fist like FDR and Woodrow Wilson did during the World Wars. Uh, presidents just don't have that much power anymore. And so this is uh, this is one of those things where in the modern world there's – there's tons of different malcontents and you know as far as the geneva convention goes let's say some hacking group uh not anonymous probably a different one were to go in and do something like this like shut down a hospital and kill tons of people like what are we going to do and is it going to be like a parallel to the 90s when uh in 2000s when we had you know uh islamic radical radical terrorists you know and that sort of thing and then we decided to go invade these countries that some of which had nothing to do with it um, it was just where the malcontents lived. And so this is one of those things where are we progressing too quick, quickly? Like, you know, Landon said, I, I don't know. But it's uh, Neuralink is big nope for me. Big <laughs> nope. Let's just say it won't mm -hmm. be the first test. Yeah. yeah. I will go. I will go straight to the woods when that happens. <laughs> yeah, and you brought up terrorism as an example of like stuff that can go wrong and cyber terrorism is absolutely a th real thing that happens mm -hmm. um it's it's of course a controversial term because nobody really knows how to define that yet but mm -hmm. it's definitely a new means of attacking other people as a form of terrorism yeah well it's not like the ir it's not like you know the al-qaeda is going to start i don't know maybe they will eventually but i don't think they quite have that capability yet but yeah similar similar sort of thing like 
raving groups trying to collect money. What was the uh, what was the big one uh, related to? It was it was a big company and uh, it was like it was one of these things where you're not supposed to give the ransomers the actual amount of money they wanted, but they had access to this company stuff. Last I think that might have been the pipeline one. I'm not positive, but and the government told them not to, and they ended up paying the the ransomers. So, oh, I think that was Colonial. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Colonial was the one. I think it's illegal them. now. If uh, Ethan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there are federal laws now that say you cannot deal with uh, people demanding ransom. I think even private companies. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so I believe that specifically violates. Um, like computer and privacy laws um there was a law passed in i think 1987 specifically about computer security stuff mm. um so yeah i, I mean, mean hacking yeah. hacking has been around since like the beginning of the internet and the beginning of computers but mm. it was obviously on a much smaller scale so malicious things have been done with computers well before you know the 80s like the early ages of computing, but right. yeah, yeah, it, it really, it really makes you think like we've, we've known about hacking for how long we have ancient laws relative to what we have on the internet. <laughs> none of it really applies anymore other than just, you know, mm-hmm. don't do unethical stuff on the internet. Yeah. And this sort of leads into a conversation. I remember this being a, conversation a couple of years ago about about an internet an internet bill of rights uh like what rights do people actually have online and so some of them are more related to uh you know social media like for example there's a debate about whether there should be a right to anonymity anonymity on the internet um and historically you've had a right to that publishing the federalist papers some of the best american documents of all time those were written anonymous anonymously originally and so there's debates like that, but there's also um, who who has a right to your data. And so companies will sell user data, and it's usually buried somewhere in the user agreement that is way too long, and no one ever reads it. I should probably read those because I'm trying to become a lawyer, so it would be smart to read documents like that. But, yeah, it's, it's, just, new, it's just a new age. Everything's new. So. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest issue with coming up with an Internet Bill of Rights is that the Internet doesn't belong to any country. Mm-hmm. It belongs to everybody equally, and so it's like, you know, socialism. Everybody owns it, but, mm-hmm. you know, how fair is it really? Yeah. And I think it, it reminds me kind of of the net neutrality talks that were happening, and uh, I know very little about what actually happened, but I know there's a lot of debate, and I don't know if that's something yeah. you want to cover here, maybe briefly, if either of you can summarize I- it. I remember the debate happening uh, back. Me and Ethan went to the same high school, which is why he's here. He's one of my buddies. And uh, I remember everyone losing their mind about net neutrality. No one actually knew what it was. And our buddy Carson goes, nothing's going to happen. And out of all the opinions that could possibly that were put forth, that was the most controversial. And then uh, after it happened, I don't actually know. Like, I don't remember, <laughs> don't remember anything Surprise. happening. So maybe, maybe he was right. But yeah, I don't actually know the full spe- spe- specificity of what it was. Um, I remember after the fact, one thing someone pointed out to me at the time was at, around the time of right before net neutrality's repeal, uh, there were he this person to me pointed out that uh, there used to be all these cell uh, cell phone provider companies like Vonage and all these other ones that used to exist, and then it turned into Verizon, T-Mobile, and Sprint, and now. After net neutrality, uh, Ryan Reynolds has Mint, Mo- Mint Mobile, and there's like that simple cellular and all these other ones that are coming back. So I don't, I don't know if it has to do with market competition or something like that. But maybe you could enlighten me, Ethan. I have no idea. Yeah, I, I actually don't know a lot about net neutrality. So, like, internet ethics is not really my field of expertise. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know that that stuff you can look up too, like. There's tons of sources on this, and and of course on the internet, there's gonna be lots of opinions on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so I think one last time, just running a quick Google search, it pretty much opened up your data to your internet service provider, the ISP. Mm-hmm. And so again, it's just sending more data out there for the world to see, uh, which 
there's again more arguments to go over that. But I think returning to this topic of cybersecurity, then less on cyber bill of rights and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I think at this time, as we're approaching our time limit, we can kind of turn to Stuxnet. Let's cover the warfare mm -hmm. topic uh, again, trying to reiterate why it matters, what its impact is. Um, mm -hmm. I give you the floor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who's so, you? okay. So as for a cyber attack to be warfare, like we have to define this first because it's a very cyber attack is a very broad term and warfare is pretty specific. Mm -hmm. So for a cyber attack to be considered warfare, in my opinion, it has to be targeted. It has to be intentional and it has to be on like a political scale. So mm -hmm. like if we can, if we do this to like physical laws and stuff, in real life, you know, not about cyber attacks or anything like if some random person gets an assault charge, like that's not, it's not a war crime. Right. Yeah. Right. But like on the same scale as cyber attacks, like somebody like cracking your password is not warfare. It's not cyber mm -hmm. warfare. It's a cyber attack, but it's not warfare. Yeah. So it has to be on a scale that is considered warfare. Right. Mm hmm. So, and, and that's a difficult thing to define because, again, this hasn't been around that long and nobody agrees on it. Yeah. And I think mentioning Stuxnet, like how a lot of people, I think, forgot it's still out there. Uh, and mm -hmm. how, I mean, these things don't go away. They are Pandora's box. Once they're open, they don't get mm -hmm. shut back. And so, again, that does introduce the very fine gray line of where does this so-called harmless act or maybe like barely harmful act against one individual turn into a whole country right in a countrywide incident that could completely cripple infrastructure freeze homes in the winter um, and then the snowball effect from there can be devastating uh, yeah. yeah I think it's also related to uh, the definition of warfare has it there actually has to be war declared so for example the United States is not technically speaking in a war with Russia right now but we're sending hundreds of millions of dollars to Ukraine, and you know there's NATO's backing, the EU. Uh, I just saw something about the UK's Mar Royal Marines were in Ukraine. So you know, for example, with the UK, like they have literal troops on the ground in Ukraine providing backup, but they're not technically because no countries uh, aside from Ukraine and Russia have declared war. It's not technically speaking uh, a war with the West versus Russia. It's technically just those two. Yeah, and and that's. That's the reason it's difficult to define cyber warfare is because no government ever is going to admit to doing anything cyber related. The mm -hmm. United States, despite everybody knowing that they did it, did Stuxnet and did not admit that they did that, mm -hmm. like, which is really frustrating to me, honestly, because it's at the point, you know, everybody knows it. You're just not taking responsibility for it mm -hmm. because here's the thing. Stuxnet got way out of hand like you said it still exists in the wild but definitely not on the scale that it was like nobody's going to be affected by it anymore because it targets a very specific uh operating system and application combination mm -hmm. but yeah it it's pretty scary because stuxnet got out and it ended up infecting nuclear reactor facilities in the united states wow. so right here in washington actually Oh my gosh. So, you know, <laughs> that could have gone really bad. And so, <laughs> like, when you don't consider that kind of thing warfare, when you release this deadly weapon that, you know, gets out all over the world. Well, you know, folks, we need to take some pride in our work. You know, frankly, we do the best cyber warfare. We do it better than anyone. That's what they tell me, you know. Excuse me, excuse me. We do the best cyber warfare that anyone has ever seen. That's what we should be like. We should take credit for it. With style. <laughs> yeah. 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 So uh, apparently, like, the, the NSA or, like, the, some NSA agent was saying that, like, it wasn't the U.S. that, you know, made the final call to release Stuxnet. Like, apparently, Israel did that without telling anyone. But, you know, that's, that's speculation. You know, obviously, the, the Bush and Obama administration, I put and most fall here because they're the ones making the calls saying, this is okay, you know, mm -hmm. go ahead and do this. And Stuxnet was primarily developed by the United States. Mm -hmm. 
specifically to target Iran. So, mm. yeah. And I think there's just a greater sentiment of the whole global war on terrorism. Uh, I just wrote a final paper on specifically the withdrawal from Afghanistan, but the history leading up to that. Uh, yeah, I think we can all agree the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, the last three, four administrations in general just have all had pretty dire consequences on their decisions in one fashion or another. And yeah. to really see, yeah, was that a grave mistake releasing Stuxnet into the wild or was it something that would have only been postponed? Uh, yeah. This is one of these things, though, where our government views it as a cost-benefit analysis. And, you know, if it's worth more to hurt Iran and also potentially hurt us a little bit than to not do anything and let Iran develop nuclear nuclear weapons, then, of course, they were going to go ahead with it. And they make these cost-benefit analyses uh, with people's lives. And this is sort of the thing that happened in Afghanistan. But, you know, I think I, I, think I mentioned it in our patriotism episode. I'm not positive. But, you know, I do not have a very high opinion of Bush Jr. I think Clinton was a better president than him. And, you know, this is coming from someone who, as Ethan knows, is about as red as you can get. Mm -hmm. So I uh, I am not a fan of George W. Bush. And to me, this is just another Bush L. So sad. And I think we all believe in some form of the military industrial complex, which Eisenhower warned us about. Am I mistaken mm -hmm. or is that true? So... So, <laughs> so I can speak so on true. a very provocative question is if our war turns more towards the cyber warfare, again, a vague term that we need to define, but if it turns towards that, how will the military industrial complex transform to this new style of war? Will it be on developing some sort of, I don't know, drone? Like, will they just start patrolling everything with drones, like physical tech? Or will it turn something else? Because I remember the war in Afghanistan, we've been sending vehicles over there for years, uh, way above quotas, way above any usage. They've been sitting in parking lots. And it really begs the question, again, they're making money through that. Uh, companies like Raytheon, uh, just for one example. But to see where will this transition happen in the future? Uh, or maybe there will no longer be individually cyber warfare, but also like human warfare like we're seeing with Russia and Ukraine. There'll be new instigated proxy wars, uh, maybe. I think yeah. it'll be a combo of both, but yeah, Ethan, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think it's going to be a combo of both. Like cyber warfare is going to be like the silent, you know, unadmitted part of warfare that nobody ever sees because everybody is keeping it under wraps. Nobody's admitting to the things that they're doing. It's just going to be a natural part of it that nobody acknowledges. Because the things that it's targeting, it's not like we're sending out drones and all this fancy technology, like nobody's making like crazy stealth bombers anymore. Like it, it's stuff you don't physically see. So it's not it's not catching anybody's eye. Yeah, they're unmanned drones. And that's how we do a vast majority of our warfare today is with these little unmanned drones, some of which are literally, I'm not even joking, the size of the laptop I'm using. And some of them are, you know, a little bit bigger, but still smaller, much smaller than like an F-16 or F-35. And that's, you know, what we do the vast majority. I mean, actually, in Afghanistan, when we killed those kids, uh, supposedly targeting terrorists originally, um, that was a that was a drone. And that's the vast majority of how the United States does warfare nowadays. It's not that we'll never send people with boots on the ground again, because you still mm -hmm. do, to some degree, actually need boots on the ground if you're going to invade a country or something like that. But the vast majority of our warfare is doing things under the table, underhanded, um, government corporation deals, and drone strikes and that sort of thing. And I think this is just another element of that. Yeah, the, the types of things that are going to be done with cyber warfare, it's going to be espionage and sabotage. Like, those are the two main things that are going to come out of cyber warfare, right? Like, mm -hmm. they're either going into it with the intention that they're going to steal, you know, government secrets or whatever, or they're going into it with the intention that they're going to bring down infrastructure. Like, mm -hmm. those are pretty much the only two ways cyber mm -hmm. is going to be used as a warfare element. Mm -hmm. um, that, or again money you know that's another motivator but less so when it comes to politics mm -hmm. it's more of the power struggle mm -hmm. yeah well yeah thank you ethan for this great insight uh, is there any last things you'd like to say before we start wrapping it up 
Uh, no, that's about it. I uh, appreciate you guys having me on here. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I, I always enjoy having, you know, people like Ethan on because he's one of the highest IQ people I know. And so it's always fun to talk to him, especially about things that I don't understand at all. Uh, so just for all of our subscribers, everybody who's going to be watching this, uh, remember, we have a YouTube that's up and running with its own special content. Uh, we've already had uh, one one vid one special video, I think, so far that was not available on Spotify or Anchor or anything like that. Um, I know we'll be on Amazon and Google Podcasts pretty soon as well. I Google believe. Podcast is now up and running. Oh, sick! Yeah. So yeah, so we're just we're just continuing to expand um, that YouTube. Please go and subscribe because there will eventually be some comedy sketches and skits. I'll try to get on top of one uh, for next week. Um, but yeah, so anything you'd like to, uh, plug, shill, anything like that, Ethan? Uh, yeah, actually. So I'm, I'm currently going to school. I go to Eastern Washington University and I'm vice president of the cybersecurity club there. Mm -hmm. Um, so one thing that we do, uh, we accept donations. Uh, a lot of the money that we have, the funding that we have goes towards helping students pay for cybersecurity competition stuff. So again, that goes back to the red team that I was talking about before. So it's training for that kind of stuff. So students get to experience uh, hacking, so to speak. So they get to learn in a real world environment and compete against each other. Uh, Eastern is pretty active when it comes to cyber competition. So that's a big thing that we do. Uh, the, the money that we make is uh, incredibly appreciated. We don't have a good way of accepting donations at the moment, but you can email Diane Hartman, I believe. Uh, it's dhartman2 at ew.edu. I'll let you we guys can know also what, include the, a what, link. The actual, yeah. Yeah, yeah. what the actual email is. Um, but yeah, much appreciated being on here again, guys. I appreciate you having me. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. So um, yeah, and also, last reminder, uh, we still need more people to send us hate mail and fan mail and suggestions for more uh, episodes you want to watch. This you know, this is was something very new. For all of us, it's something uh, fun to learn about. And so this is just one of those subjects where it was uh, just sort of thrown together. But please send us recommendations for what you want. Um, and that's that's pretty much the end. Yeah, that is. So, Riley? I'm, uh, I'm Riley Stansberry. And I'm Landon Connor. We'll see you guys next time on The Crux of the Matter.